a big shock to me when I got the death penalty. I was scared. Over 50 women are currently imprisoned on America's death row. So many of these cases are horrible crimes. How did this person come to do an act so violent? They were wives, mothers, young women with their whole lives ahead of them. So how did they end up on death row? She was seen as evil. People said she was evil. She was an active participant in this horrific murder. We examine the crimes of seven American women who were condemned to die. She cold-bloodedly murdered her own son. These people were kidnapped and buried alive. Nadine Smith told her, you will die a slow death. And we discover what happened to them. She apologized to the families of the victims. Some escaped the death chamber. I came two days away from my execution. I had a fear of being strapped to that gurney. Others were not so lucky. In one year, the three women on death row were all executed. It was a terrifically cruel crime. I think justice was done. everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me. If I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. Women make up only a small fraction of the total death row population in America today. Less than 2%. From the early 70s, we've had almost 1,200 men executed and only 11 women. There's a general reluctance by juries to execute women. The thought of killing a woman, I think, is just not as palatable or as acceptable. But occasionally, juries do impose the ultimate punishment on female killers. Women are typically viewed as nurturers. If they commit a violent crime that takes away from that identity or public perception, they may look more terrible or monstrous than a man. As a prosecutor, the goal is to try to convince the jury that the gender is not relevant. What's relevant is the facts and the law. A capital murder is a killing plus some other factors that make it worse. Killing two or three people, killing them through a torture, killing them during a robbery or a rape or a kidnapping. In some cases, geography determines the difference between a life sentence and a death sentence. State to state, it's going to be handled quite differently, and quite frankly, even from prosecutor to prosecutor. In the modern era, the states that have executed the most women are Oklahoma, Florida, and Texas. Texas has been the death penalty capital of the United States for a long time. It was in Houston, Texas, that a brutal double murder put one woman on death row for almost 20 years. On the night of the 3rd of March, 1980, a frantic young woman flagged down a police car and confessed to murder. I just wanted to admit to the crime. Pam said me and Mike killed two bobs in Houston. She signed a 26-page confession. And I read how graphic her confession was. A hair on my neck stood up. 24-year-old Pam Perillo was one of three hitchhikers involved in the robbery and murder of two men. Mike held one end of the rope and told me to take the other end. The facts of the case were just so brutal. The state of Texas said she should die for her crimes. My confession is what got me the death penalty. What drove this young woman to commit such shocking acts of violence and then to confess? This case would never have been solved if Pam had not given a confession. Pamela Lynn Perillo was born in 1955 and grew up near Los Angeles. She remembers a deprived childhood that was scarred by abuse. My mother used to whip us with um, curtain rods and extension cords. My father started drinking and molesting me and my older sister. She'd been in like eight foster homes. Started using drugs when she was not even a teenager. Eventually, Pam dropped out of school and took to the streets. I used heroin every day. Did whatever we had to do to get the money. A lot of burglaries. Pam fell pregnant age 22 
and gave birth to a son, but continued her self-destructive lifestyle. I was working as a topless dancer. When she was 24, Pam met Linda and Michael Briddle. Mike had been an inmate in San Quentin. News media claimed he was one of the most evil people that had ever lived. He was just one of those guys who enjoyed being a crook. Linda had met and married Mike while he was in prison. Mike was out on parole in early 1980 when the couple befriended Pam. Within weeks, Mike Brittle had robbed one of Pam's customers at a topless bar. I was with Mike and another man when it happened. Mike and Linda fled to Arizona to avoid arrest. They phoned and invited Pam to join them. The police was looking for us, and so I agreed to go. The three all got together, and they were basically hitchhiking across the country. We were all pretty much heroin addicts. Speed, PCP, all kinds of pills. The trio ended up in Houston, where they eventually met 30-year-old Robert Banks. Bob Banks had just moved to Houston. He happened to notice three hitchhikers on the 610 freeway. He asked us if we would help him move. Robert Banks let the three hitchhikers stay, even taking them out to a rodeo the following night. Every time he paid for something, he paid with a $100 bill. Riddle remarked at the rodeo, we got a pigeon here. We all started discussing that we were going to rob him. After the rodeo, a friend of Banks, 26-year-old Bob Skeens, turned up at the house. Bob Skeens arrived to help him finish his move, and they all kind of hang out together that night. The next morning, Banks and Skeens went out to get some coffee and some donuts. According to Pam, Mike decided to ambush the men when they returned with breakfast. Mike was in the closet, and when they came back, Mike came out and had a rifle, told him to lay down on the floor. Banks didn't want to, and Mike hit him with the butt end of the rifle. Mike told Linda and I to go to the garage and find some rope. He had me and Linda tie Banks up. Then we took Bob Skeens to the other bedroom and tied him up. They started ransacking the house, looking for things to steal. The plan was take the money and leave. But Mike said that we couldn't leave them alive because they had seen us. The court records tell two different versions of what happened next. And they decided to kill these two guys. They set Linda out to sit outside in the car. Mike put the rope around Robert Banks' neck. Mike gets on one end of the rope, and Pam gets on there, and they simply pull on it till he dies. But Pam alleges that Linda was inside the house during the murders. Linda was in the back bedroom with Skeens. Mike put the rope around Banks' neck. He said, y'all are going to be a part of this, too. He told me to take the other end and pull. And then he called Linda out there and had her do the same. When you choke somebody to death, they don't die within a minute or two minutes. It takes about seven minutes for someone to die. Bob Skeens could hear Bob Banks being killed and knew he was going to be next. After Banks was murdered, Pam says that Mike told Linda to pack the car. Pam stayed with Mike. When they get through killing them, they decide to eat the donuts and coffee the two guys had brought. The three killers drove Bob Skeen's car to Dallas, then caught a bus to Denver. There, they pawned items stolen from Robert Banks's house. I couldn't believe that what happened had just happened. Mike told me that he would never let me out of his sight after what we did. He threatened to kill me. On the 3rd of March, one week after the murders, Pam says she crept out while Mike was sleeping to call the police. As I was on the phone, Mike came out of the room. He tried to hit me over my head. She ran outside, flagged down a police car. Pam said me and Mike killed two bobs in Houston. I'm admitting to my part in all of this. She gave a 26-page graphic written confession admitting everything. The police kept Pam in custody and arrested Mike and Linda Brittle. The three suspects were sent back to Texas to face trial. That was a time in Texas when they were cranking out death penalties left and right. In Houston, we had a rising tide of murders. Presented with her 26-page confession, the jury convicted Pam Perillo. 
My confession is what got me the death penalty. I was very young. I was scared. Linda Briddle never confessed to being part of the murders, and Pam's written confession didn't implicate her. Linda hit the jackpot on that one. She should have at least gotten some years in the penitentiary. Michael Briddle went on trial in 1982. Linda's testimony against him sealed his fate. Pam Perillo spent three years on death row before a legal technicality saw her sentence reversed. She stood trial for a second time in October 1984. Robert Pelton was assigned to defend her. When I met her, she was a frightened woman. She had already been sentenced to death once. She just felt real guilty. and She didn't, didn't have much of a desire to live. Jim Skelton, Linda's former lawyer, was brought in to help with the case. In the first trial, they didn't bring anything out about her background. She'd been abused as a child. There's no excuse for killing two people, but it explained it all. The prosecution compelled Linda Briddle to give evidence against Pam. Linda was turning state evidence on me and claiming not to even be in the house. She kept lying. Also damaging to Pam's defense were the crime scene photos. What happened to those two bobs was tragic. The photographs were something you couldn't even imagine. Pam's lawyer claimed Mike Brittle was the ringleader. Mike Brittle, he was a horrible human being. We wanted to paint a picture how Mike Brittle could take a middle-class girl like Linda to do all these things, and how much more easily it'd be to take someone like Pam who came from a tragic background. I always thought that Pam and Mike were kind of co-equal. You know, when the death penalty came back, I just really felt kind of sorry for her. She probably did deserve the death penalty. It's thought it was a really sad situation. Perillo was sent back to death row. She was twice scheduled to be executed. I didn't have a fear of death, but I had a fear of being strapped to that gurney. I kept going over my mind what I was going to say to the victim's families at my execution. Both times, she was granted a stay of execution. I came two days from my execution. I was walking into the visiting room to say goodbye to my family. The phone rang. It was my attorneys, and they said, the Fifth Circuit has just given you a stay. I was jumping up and down. The officer, she was jumping up and down with me. But a fellow death row inmate was not so lucky. Carla Faye Tucker was my best friend for many, many years. We grew up on death row together. I learned what it was like to have a real sister. Tucker was executed in February 1998. I got very angry at God when they executed Carla, and I threw my Bible away. I had to realize it wasn't God that took Carla. She was ready to meet him. I miss her a lot. In 1999, a court of appeal again reversed Pam's death sentence. It was like this weight was just lifted off of me. They claim I had a conflict of interest because I had represented Linda in an earlier trial and took her on as a witness in Pam's trial. Perillo chose not to stand trial again. My son told me, Mom, please don't take that chance again. Instead, she accepted a life sentence with the possibility of parole. Pam was finally off death row. I went 20 years on death row without being able to touch my son because death row inmates visit behind glass. Now I'm able to hold my grandbaby. I've grown up a lot in here. I just want my life to mean something, that my experiences would deter somebody in another direction. She'll never be able to make up for what she did, but she's trying to help people now. What we did was wrong. It's not anything that goes away or that I ever stop thinking about. I'll never be able to give back what I took, and I pay for that every day.